Welcome back to the core. We're covering human relations in world missions, and we were last talking about the religions of the world and the missionaries specifically about our approach to these religions, how we can become embedded by looking through the open door, and when we're there, we can be the first people to tell them about Jesus, which means we have to simplify our product, simplify it down to the pure gospel in its presentation, like Paul did, looking for these redemptive analogies. And four rules of engagement. That's where we are now. We're going to look at these four rules of engagement with other religious beliefs. The first thing that we've been talking about all this time is gather intelligence. Find out as much as possible about the people and their religion before speaking to them on the subject of Christ. Find out the level of religious involvement of the person. You understand? So we, we've already learned as we've studied here, it is your, your job to go get videos on YouTube, whatever, get books, learn about Islam, learn about Hinduism, learn, depending on where you're going, right? You might be going to some other group. They might be animists of some sort of species because even you c cannot lump all into one category. For instance, if you go into Indonesia, and you want to preach the gospel there, yes, Islam is the religion, but it is mixed with the religions of the past and their beliefs about the dead, and there are hybrids of this. You get into Bali, for instance, it is a, a form of very specific species of Hinduism there, and it is very unique, and all of the houses have these idol posts or places where they give offerings to their gods and their ancestors um, before them. And over Bali is this massive idol, the largest idol I have ever seen with my own eyes of the Garuda or the great eagle god that is there in Bali towers, towers over the city. And so that is within Indonesia, this rare pocket of extreme specific type of Hinduism, which I've been studying lately. That's the one of the religions I've studied most recently as we're doing church planting there. And we have our missionaries there that are working and doing a great job. And we're going to be involved. Projects coming up. Definitely want to do the work there. So funny when I tell people we're doing missions in Bali, uh, they immediately, they're like, I'll go. Oh, here am I. Send me. Because they want to go there. And it is beautiful. The beaches are gorgeous. The Weather is very nice when it's cool. It's actually cold at night on the beach. You need a, a sweater on and the food is delicious and inexpensive. It's, it is a beautiful atmosphere there. But we need another religion of those people. Outside of that, there are a lot of Muslims there. But as, for instance, I did work in Aceh. And in Aceh, they, they have a very specific, strict form of Islam but they also have witches and warlocks. They have sorcerers that are not really pure Islam, but are other ideas. And I saw this with my own eyes when I worked there. When I was working in Indonesia after the tsunami, when the tsunami came, that horrible one that happened years ago, and you know, so many, so many people died uh, there, up to a quarter of a million people died all the way from that region when that tsunami came, in fact, all the way up into Phuket, also Thailand, uh, many regions. But the worst hit area was there in Aceh. And when I went there to work, it was uh, a very hard mission field. But I wept with my Muslim friends there over the loss of their... I met a man there that uh, when I was sitting and hearing his his story about the tsunami, he showed me the tree that he climbed up into and tied himself in, and he still went underwater, and he was about 30 feet, about, it's like, you know, maybe 10 meters up this tree, and still the wave was that high when it came in. Unbelievable, 10 meter high wall of water that came in, and he was not home at the time. He's a fisherman, he ran and climbed this tree, and later, uh, when he came back, he found out that 42 members of his family died. 42 members. Virtually every 
one. And I stood with him as he stared out into the ocean. And at that moment, when you're consoling someone on such loss, you, you really, you're not thinking about their religion. You're just thinking about more the humanity and the suffering that people go through. And he stared out into the ocean and he says, it took them. He said, the water came and it took them. And I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to react to that. So I just, uncharacteristically within the culture, I just grabbed him and I hugged him and he broke and he cried and I cried as much as he did. And we just cried together there on the beach. And I made a very close friend that day. And I got to meet him a couple of times as I was going in and out of Aceh during that time. And there were other people that are very open, but I also saw that their, their Islam was very different. Well, we know we hear about Sunni and Shiite and these different groupings. Well, you're gonna have to find out about the version of Islam. When you gather intelligence, you're going to find out what kind of Muslims are these. You're going to find out what kind of Hindus, because I saw Hinduism in Mumbai, in the state of Maharashtra. I saw it in the villages, and it is very different than the Hinduism of Bali. It is two different species with different principles, different ideas, and although based similar, and I need to know that, I see here in Singapore, I've seen the things that uh, took pl take place in the temple here during their celebrations and the body piercings they do and they wear these big heavy cages and they go into these trances. I've seen them totally taken over by demons and fluttering around. I've been as close as, as uh, just a few feet away from them watching this. I've observed these things and gosh, it's such a different form of Hinduism than what I saw in certain villages. So it's, a, it's all up to you to know your area that you're working in to know the village you're working in and find out as much as possible about the people and their religious belief of that area, how to do that. Now, I found two basic categories. As you're gathering this information, I have identified two basic categories of religious affiliation. One is cultural affiliation and two is spiritual affiliation. In the gathering of intelligence, the first thing you want to know is the person or people and I want to explain that about culture real quick. When we're thinking about religions, you have a nation. Let's start that with an ethnos. Then you have a region of that nation, correct? And then you have a village of that region. Then you have a, an area of that village. Then you have a house on that block or in that community. And then in that house, you have seven or eight people and you've seen these different echelons of cultural religious changing. I have found that every individual, every person, one by one, is their own unique religious culture. And you don't understand them. And everyone is going to be different. So when you're gathering intelligence, you gather it first of the nation, then of the region, then of the town or village, then of the neighborhood, then of the house, then of the person. Notice it's like a, it's like a uh, focusing. And you have to ask questions to determine whether they have a cultural affiliation or a spiritual affiliation. You might ask, well, what does that mean? I'll tell you, cultural affiliation is this. They know everything about their religion. They know it here in their minds. They have studied it. They fulfilled probably the tenets of their faith or whatever the rites of passage are, whether it be some type of um, uh, offerings given for them at temples or whatever it is. They've been through that. If you ask them what their religion is, they will answer you and tell you what they were told. You understand? Now, let me apply this to Christianity. There are a lot of Christians out there who are culturally affiliated. For instance, you might know Christians that you don't think are very much like Christ. You probably know a lot of them. And you think, yeah, they're Christians, but huh, by name only, we call it nominal Christianity. Well, that means they are culturally affiliated. They don't really know Jesus. They're not in a relationship with Jesus. They, Jesus is a historical figure within the teachings of their culture. And so therefore, they will tell you they are Catholic, but 
they don't know Jesus. They will tell you they're Christian. They might be part of a Baptist church. They might be part of a full gospel church. And they're still only culturally affiliated because that's where they've been brought their whole life. And you know these people because when you ask them questions like, oh, so you, are you a believer in Christ? Well, my parents always took me to church. Right there, the first indication that they are not really spiritually connected, they're culturally affiliated. Now for us, as those that preach the gospel, using that ideal or that principle of determining culture affiliation by these questions as you're gathering information, you will find people within Islam, within Buddhism, within Hinduism, exactly like that. I, I have spoken to Hindus before. What is your religion? Well, I was raised Hindu. Why would you say I was raised Hindu? If you ask me what my religion is, I'm going to tell you outright, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to tell you I was raised a Christian because to me what matters is that I am connected spiritually to Christ. But if my association is not really spiritual, it's just cultural, I will name, I will say, my parents always brought me to church. Same with Hindus. Well, uh, when I was growing up, my family always went to the temple. But they're not owning it. You know, they're not saying this is my thing. And you find this amongst a lot of young people. They might be Muslim. They say, well, you know, our, my, my parents um, are Muslim. They'll say that. And the reason this is happening is because the percentage of culturally affiliated people in religious systems around the world is exponentially increasing as we're approaching the end of the age and the return of Christ. And this facilitates our ease in bringing the gospel to people if we are not attacking their cultural affiliation to that religion. Because they're not really tied to anything. And I have led many people to Christ. I have prayed with people from all religious backgrounds to know Jesus as their Savior. And it was easy to do because they weren't all tied down to being anything. They were ripe fruit, ready. And you determine this by asking those questions. And when you hear those answers, well, my family, they, do, they don't own it for themselves. And that's what we call cultural affiliation. Now, on the other hand, you have the spiritual affiliation. Wow. These guys you recognize right away. What is your religion? I'm Catholic. I was born a Catholic. I'll die a Catholic. I was saying New Orleans. I'm born a Catholic. I'll die a Catholic, my mom and my, my family used to say. Died in the wool, we call it. Uh, in Mexico, they call it hueso colorado, which means colored bone, meaning to the bone. We are Catholic. When they say that, with pride and stand up in your face, then you know they are spiritually affiliated, meaning there is a spirit of that religion in operation through them, in them, and speaking through them. Now, if this is Christianity and it is the gospel, that might be the Holy Spirit. If Once again, if you ask a fervent, spiritually affiliated Christian about their beliefs, uh, what religion are you? I'm, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll start preaching the gospel to you straight off. Jesus who died for me. And I believe he died on the cross. He shed his blood. My sins he took upon himself. And they'll start crying. I mean, that's because the Holy Spirit is in them, right? They're spiritually associated and affiliated with the religion that we call Christianity. And it's a beautiful picture. I'm certainly that way. I am definitely spiritually affiliated to my religion. At this point, as a missionary, I, I diverge from all religion. I just know truth of the gospel, and I accept that and teach that. But you find this to be true within other realms, too. I have met Muslims. What religion are you? I am Muslim. Allah is the only true God. Allah Akbar. And they start praying and tell you that in Muhammad is his prophet, there's only one. And the Quran says, and they start declaring to you, you feel it right away. The vehicle, the taxi, or wherever you're talking to this guy suddenly fills with Islam. You feel like you're in a mosque. That's a spiritual connection, spiritual upon them. In fact, they will then make it their goal to convince you that Allah is the only way. And that you must know him through Muhammad, his prophet. He only has, there's only one God, one prophet. Allah Akbar! And they, they, like, you, wow. 
I respect it, but it is a spiritual association and affiliation. At that point, now I've gathered information and intelligence, and I know I have my work cut out for me. I know I'm not going to get this guy to bow his knee to Jesus then and there. But when I meet that guy and ask them in their responses, yeah, I was raised, my parents would take me to the mosque. Oh, okay. And then I know. See, that immediately tells me the door is open and I will walk through that door to share my beliefs as they share their beliefs. If their beliefs are culturally affiliation or they are culturally affiliated to their belief system, then no different than learning about other cultures, no different I eat Chinese food or I eat Mexican food. That's how easy it is for some of them to try out other things and taste and see that the Lord is good. Maybe they've only eaten Chinese food their whole life because they've been Buddhists. But that's just it because my mom's always taken me to the Chinese food restaurant. Well, you know what? I have some, I have some Mexican food. Did you ever eat taco before? No. You want to try it? Sure. Because it's okay. I can try these different flavors. That's how some people view religion. And if they do, that's good news for you and I, or for you and me, for us, because we are the ones that preach the message to them, and now they're open. So that is a determination that we can make, and we do that first. I do that first. Then I know how to proceed. And after that, I go to step number two about these rules of engagement with other religious beliefs in the cultures that we live as missionaries is to investigate the heart. Each individual human being is on a different level of recognizing truth. You have to investigate the person to find out. You understand? If the person is ready, you can progress to the presentation of the full gospel. If not, you still have to lay foundational truth. And I have found people in all different rungs of this ladder of development of understanding of Christ. They've come in from different religious backgrounds, but I cannot rush the system. There seems to be a system in place, the sovereignty again, as I told you about. God has a plan and he's working on these individuals because he loves them very much. And very often they have complex networks of prayers going on from their family members that they could come to know Christ. Like the one time I was talking to a guy here in Singapore and as we began to speak, I saw that he had all the icons of Buddhism around him and the little Hello Kitty uh, asking for fortune and, and prosperity on the dashboard. You know, did you ever see those little kitties with the thing? He had, other, you know, it was pretty obvious. And often people that I'm preaching to are in taxis and in public environments like this. That's my mission field. And so I could tell. And he asked who I was and I started telling him who I was and I shared the gospel with him. And he said, <sighs> he hung his head. And I said, what's wrong? Because he was very friendly and I had already had a nice conversation with him. But I just got finished telling him the Yoga Leon. And he says, man, he says, you sound exactly like my sons. He says, you sound like every... He says, I'm, I'm like the only one left. And I said, the only what? I said, he said, Buddhist. He said, everybody, just one by one. And all of them, all the time. That's just all I ever hear about. And that's all they ever talk about. And I said, well, sir, you have to understand, they have met such a wonderful, wonderful person in Jesus Christ. That they are over, head over heels in love with him. And when you love somebody, you just talk about him to the people you love. You want them, and that's how much they love you. They love you so much they want you to know that joy. And he shook his head. He said, yeah, I know, I know. And he had tears in his eyes. And I happened to be there right at the moment that he was at the last rung. And I said, you know, I said, you, you might as well just receive Christ. Obviously, he's not going to stop coming after you. And he says, yeah, I think I need to do that. What a privilege it was. Like, it's like falling in my hands, this perfect open person. But I certainly wasn't the first person. Imagine the first conversations in the battle, in the war. So each individual, only the heart knows its own bitterness, the Bible says. And he'd been through a long line. Sometimes I'm one of the first people. You know when you're planting those first seeds. Because look, there's three elements, right? Three levels to the gospel. Some plant, some water, some reap the harvest. Those three levels, that man I just told you about was in the reaping level. It was time. He was ripe and it was time. But before that, he would have been in the watering level. 
which I often find people that, yeah, I heard about this Jesus. Okay, and then immediately I know I'm not planting a seed, I'm watering a seed. And so I always ask, who did you hear from? Well, my brother-in-law. I don't know, he's some pastor. So, oh, really, what church? And I start asking, how do, I want to find out how best to water that seed that was already planted there. I'm not looking to pull the seed out and plant a new seed. Imagine if we went around pulling seeds out and putting new seeds in every time. We would never see a harvest. It has to germinate. It has to start to develop. It has to grow roots and then it sprouts and bears fruit. So we find out where are they. Sometimes there's nothing there. And we plant the first seed. And that's a great privilege to be there in that moment. But we don't know this until we step to here, as I'm, we're talking about in our book, till we investigate the heart. Remember, we're talking about these four rules of engagement concerning religious beliefs. Sometimes you only plant a seed. That's all. And that's enough. If you know you're just planting the seed and you sense resistance, back off. I'm telling you, back off. Just smile. It's nice talking to you, sir. It was great to spend time with you. And I do that all the time. I have a lot of seeds. I throw seeds out all day long here everywhere, willy-nilly, just seeds, 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 seeds. No problem. But watering is another level. Then watering, I need to know where the seed is and where it came from and what kind of seed it is. Of course, it's a seed of the belief in Christ. But sometimes you find out it's a seed of the Jehovah's Witness or a seed of Mormons. But they don't know. They think it's Christianity. And so you have to work around that too. And you know, oh, you don't want that seed. Then you do want to pick that seed out. But you find that out. All this requires an interaction with the people. Now the third step is simply preach the truth of Christ. So be careful with your manner of preaching. You can run someone off before they're ready to receive truth. Pace yourself. And this means that when you tell them about Jesus, read the signs. Look at the way they're responding to you. Look at the, their body language. It's better that you be in a position looking at them eye to eye, or you're sitting at a table, or you're talking to them. I can tell when I'm in a church sharing and people bring family members and there will be, during the service, I can tell arms will be folded and people who are resistant are resistant. We have lots of people come to our church that do not know Christ, nor ever want to know Christ. They just come in there because their family talked them into coming, and we, that's good. Leave them alone. Just make sure that you preach the gospel from the pulpit without directing it at them, but you are. But don't let them know it. Don't look at them the whole time. Jesus died for the sinner. No, you look around and you just talk about Jesus Christ. The rest of the church is going to think, why is Stephen talking about the gospel? Then usually when they see me doing that, they know somebody lost is in this room. So they start looking around for who it is and start praying, oh God, save that sinner. So that's good. But anyway, you assess this, you pace yourself, be careful the way you do it. Now, later on in the fellowship of such services, I sit down with those people more directly, get to know them a little bit, and then work my way over to the truth and hopefully start fishing around for the gift of the word of knowledge, listening to the Holy Spirit. He may give me insights to that person and how to reach out to them, but preach the truth of Christ. Pace yourself carefully. Don't overdo it too quickly or run them off. Pray according to the cultural norm. Now, this is interesting. You know, the definition of communication with God, prayer, will be different in each culture. And so, therefore, when somebody wants to pray with you, you should use the format that is accepted by the person. I remember one time I was in New Orleans, and I was at somebody's house, and it was an older man, and I had planted a few seeds in him. I met him at different times, and finally this is the day that he came to receive Christ, at least in that visit. And when I was talking to him, he was touched by my testimony and my stories, and the Holy Spirit was there on him. And I finally asked him, I said, would you like to pray with me to receive Jesus? And he said, yes. And before anything could happen, he immediately got on his knees and did the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, first of all, there's nothing wrong with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's nothing wrong with the shape of a cross. So there is no religious barrier for me in that. That's fine. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I realize it's a Catholic thing, but he was on his knees and doing it. So you know what I did? I knelt right next to him. I did not actually do that. But as he did it, he, his eyes were closed. He didn't know I wasn't doing it. But I was kneeling next to him. Why would you kneel? Because it was his form of prayer. It was his submission to God. 
And so I knelt with him. And when I prayed with him, in fact, I very carefully sculpted the prayer to be more adjusted to a Catholic mentality. And he prayed, and tears come from his eyes, and he received Jesus. And so we pray according to the cultural norm. Don't immediately try to enforce your culture. Culture, make sure that you always know there's a distinction between these things. You can just pray sitting there. Some people don't even close their eyes when you pray. You say, can you pray with your eyes open? You most certainly can pray with your eyes open. Sometimes just looking at them, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Do you want to receive Jesus? Yeah. So well, then say these words with me. Say, Jesus. And they say, Jesus. And they can say it looking in your eyes. And sometimes you can say, you know, well, you know, actually you're talking to Jesus. Jesus is everywhere. He says, Lord, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. So he's right here with us. So let's just pretend he's sitting right there in that chair. I, didn't, I don't say, look up to heaven. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. You're going to hell. No. I say, just, you know, express yourself naturally. Just say he's in that chair right there. What would you tell him as I'm telling him? I'm telling you, you tell him. Say, Jesus, in this chair here? Yeah. Jesus. And I bring them through that visualization of Christ there. Speaking second person, singular, you, receive you, Jesus, take my sins, and walking them through it. And they have a moment there that they identify and have an experience and receive Christ. So you pray according to the cultural norm. I think it's very important. So that definite. So respecting the fact that a person believes in something and not in what he or she believes will enable us to wisely redirect the belief to Jesus. And religious devotion can be channeled to God. In other words, the enthusiasm that you find in a given religious system, maybe you find the most vehement and forceful Muslim you've ever met, or the most dedicated Buddhist and the most dedicated Hindu always go in the temple, that does not mean that they are far from Christ. Sometimes it means they are seconds away because that fervor, that excitement can easily be redirected. Sometimes it takes only one blinding flash of light at noonday on the road to Damascus for someone who is completely anti-Christ followers that is so completely against the followers of Christ that he's murdering them to come to complete change and repentance. Stop persecuting me. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. I'm the guy you're fighting against. Oh, just like that. In that moment that he had that revelation, he saved. Who are you to say that the most, most avid declares of their faith, the most, most focused and dedicated Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and Taoists and you name atheists, they, it, that quick can change. Your obligation is to pray for them. So be ready for them in any moment to make those changes. Very exciting. Now we go on to this subject of other missionaries and the missionary. Now, this is interesting. When we go to the foreign field to work for the Lord, we find ourselves surrounded by many different religious groups and their representatives. As missionaries, we will inevitably encounter other missionaries from other religious groups. Some of these missionaries will be from our group, in other words, as believers in Christ, and maybe close friends, maybe even from the same mission, or the same church of sending, or at least the same region, maybe American missionaries on the field. And the majority of the missionaries that return, this is very important you understand this, that the majority of the missionaries that return from the foreign field because of problems do so uh, due to the differences they have with other missionaries. This is an alarming statistic, but I like to always share it because it's true. Let's say that you're a missionary out there. And in missionaries, we know the average is five years Five years as a veteran missionary. If you make it past five years, you're a veteran missionary. Uh, when you find somebody like me, 35 years this is a rare thing. Very rare. Most people only last four, five years, six years maybe, and then they, they just end up doing something else. Not that they deny Christ, and not that they quit the ministry. They just might shift to their home country. Someone like me, their whole life out on the foreign field, offering their children 
to the nations and the nations taking them like Japan has taken my sons for the declaration of the gospel. God has arranged that <clears throat> like the Lord. It will bring my daughter. My daughter has no inclination or desire to ever live in the United States of America. Of course, she's an American citizen. She bears a passport. She'd go back anytime she wants. She's not interested. She finds the whole culture distasteful. She has a greater interest in Asia, a deeper interest either in Japan or Korea. And I'm going to follow what the Lord tells in her. But anyway, 35 years we've been doing this, my wife and I. We have no plans to go anywhere else. This is what we do. But that's not very common. You don't always find that. But anyway, amongst these people out there, there are, there's some of the missionaries that quit. There's usually a reason why they quit. And you would think it would be because they had persecution. The missionaries quit because the persecution is so great and the resistance of the enemy is so great against them that they can't handle it. And they go back, no, that's not one of the reasons why. I mean, that's not, there is a reason sometimes, but that's not the number one reason. Uh, you might think, well, it's the, the mental strain of having to learn a new language and they can't, just can't learn the language and because of their inability, they just can't handle it anymore and the stress and so they just go back home and stop trying. No, that's not the number one reason. That might be a reason sometimes, but I actually find it to be pretty rare. Because you can make it without learning a language. I mean, I suggest you learn languages and we're going to go in depth into that category and talk about learning languages and how to do it, but you can make it without learning the language. So it's not really that. So what else is it? Well, it's, is it because of a lack of finances? What if you just don't have the proper funding and you're out there and you're just trying to eke out a, a, a living on a little bit to make it as a missionary? No, that's not really the reason. You might think, what about sickness and disease? That has to be a big reason why missionaries fail. No, sickness and disease is not it. The number one reason, the number, like I would go as far as to say 90% of the missionaries that quit the mission field and go home. They do so because of differences with other missionaries. That's a cold, hard statistic, but it's a fact. If I tell you now though, and you dedicate yourself as a missionary, and maybe you go work somewhere, and then you know, be prepared. Believe me, this is what Jesus would tell you. Jesus will tell you, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. Beware of the doctrines of men. I would tell you as a missionary, beware of the missionary groups. Beware of the missionaries. It's not distrust. It's just the facing of the facts. You say, you mean those from another denomination? No. People within your group. Watch out for Barnabas at your side. Paul and, Paul and Barnabas. That, they broke apart. And Barnabas went his way and Paul went his way and I, they didn't go home. Um, Paul didn't at least. I don't know what happened to Barnabas, but to make a long story short, there are differences that are going to happen and that will happen. I've had differences with missionaries through the years, but I've learned to be careful. And I remember what a great word of advice I was given years ago by David Hogan. I was talking to him one day and he was saying, when you're out on the mission field, you're out there preaching the gospel, you're going to the villages and sometimes you'll see Sometimes you see out there another American and they'll be out there in the jungle or they'll be out there at this village and you see them out there. If you ever see them, I'll tell you what to do. And I'm like, well, go greet them, be hospitable. He says, run away from them. <laughs> he said, avoid them like the plague. You want nothing to do with it. They will kill you. They'll stab you in the back. They'll destroy you if they can. I remember thinking, wow, that's really, really cynical. Uh, now I understand why all these years later because I have seen a lot of opposition in that realm. But I knew already how to be careful with those individuals. And I'm not saying you just distrust all people that are missionaries, but just watch yourself because of these statistics and because of the falling out that you'll have. So we have to learn to coexist on the foreign field with other missionaries while still accomplishing the job that God has sent us to do. How can we walk in peace? Before I went to the mission field, I was given that advice from, a vet, from David Hogan, the veteran missionary, who told me, avoid contact with the missionaries unless absolutely necessary. And I did not understand it at the time, but now I do. And in fact, uh, when we went to the South in Mexico, we went to pioneer work. We were not associated with any other Americans. We were living near the city of Acapulco. And then to go in Acapulco, you saw Americans everywhere all day long. It's a tourist city, right? So there's everywhere 
the love boat would come and dock. The love boat promises something for everyone. You know, that, that old TV series from the 70s. That love boat would come and all these cruise ships, the Pacific Princess and uh, these different Virgin Atlantic and all these ships come and dump out thousands and thousands of Americans who would come and party on the strip and have a great time. And I want to eat some tacos, mama. You know, they would have a great time. Uh, I never had anything to do with any of them. I had no interest. That's not why I was there. I lived in a neighborhood on the other side of the mountain that had no Americans in it. He had no Caucasians at all. It was all only Mexicans. And till one day, I saw, uh, 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 in our own neighborhood, I saw the first other, this is 65,000 people in this community, it was just me and Barbara. And I saw this one other guy. And when I saw him, I remember thinking, that's the guy David Hogan was talking about. Better watch it. And I was afraid to even relate to him. So I prayed and asked the Lord what I should do because I saw him more than once and I noticed he was going to the post office and if he had been to the post office more than a couple of times, he had to live there somewhere because we had post office boxes there that we would um, rent and that's where we'd pick up mail. And so as he was going there, I prayed and I asked God, I said, okay, today, Lord, as I go down, I did like, um, should I marry into a relationship with this man and uh, in his family? And if I do, how will I know it? Let it be that today, when I go to the post office, I meet him there. It was kind of like Eliezer um, trying to choose the bride for Isaac. Remember the story? So that's what I prayed that morning. I said, Lord, if it's your will, then I will meet him even at the post office the time I go, and he will be there. And if you want it to happen, it'll happen. So anyway, that day, that very day, I went down to the post office. I went in there, and coming out with my parcel, he was coming in the door. And we smiled at each other. And I knew immediately that God was saying, yeah, meet him. So I said, hey, how are you doing? Great, great. So we had a talk. And so I set up. He invited me to his house to visit his family. And I agreed. And my wife and I went. And honestly, you know what I did? And, and I did this right from the beginning. And I was afraid he would be offended by it. I said to him, I said, it's so nice to meet you. And it, as far as a connection with a friend, someone that, that I can have friendship with, that's great, but as, as far as our ministries are concerned, I honestly do not want to have our ministries connected at all. And I didn't know how he was going to respond, but he immediately had my same perspective. He said, I'm 100% on board with that. He said, why don't we just fellowship as brothers and your ministry is your ministry by a minute, we don't have to. You know, okay. I met another missionary, a friend of his that he was working with. Uh, kind of his superior, but not really, peer superior, just longer on the field there. And when I met him, I greeted him, and he was all eyeing me up and being very careful, and which I understand. And the same thing I said, because he started asking me about my ministry and my church and this and how long and who and what and where, and very nosy. And I said, you know, honestly, I would like that. I don't mind being your friend, but let our ministries do their own things because, you know, there's no competition between lighthouses. You guys can do your thing. We'll do our thing. He was like, all right, yeah, that's how you see it? Okay. And that's the last I ever talked to him. He walked away, was not interested at all. So it shows you different people, different strokes for different folks. But I knew protect the ministry, guard, because I don't know who's going to come. And our ministry was, there were absolutely no foreigners in it except for me. It was all Mexicans until missionaries came after the harvest started, missionaries came to work with me, and those were from the United States of America. Lucy Crabtree came, uh, David Hassenbuller came, and his later um, other missionaries came and worked on and off with us. It was a real blessing. A lot of them have come and gone through our ministry in our absence after we left for India. But uh, it was Jeannie Coxey came, wonderful, wonderful woman that educated my children in homeschooling and sweet, sweet sister. Sister Jeannie, some, she watches some of these videos. I don't know if she'll see this when she does. Hi, Jeannie. And, but the, that guy was Mike Davis is his name. I'm mean, the good guy that when we connected, he became close friends of mine. I just recently heard from him and it was very fun. So they're still in ministry back in the United States doing their thing. But anyway, be careful in those relationships with them. Make sure it's the Lord that leads you in those connections. And I asked this question, who are the strongholds? Well, we know that the scripture says 
uh, in Ephesians 6. Let's read that passage in verse 10 where it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now I want to talk about this. It says here, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against these powers and these spirits. And we often refer to this, who are the strongholds? Well, when we read this passage, we often interpret to be speaking of the spiritual entities that are in the air that resist us. But I've found that the real resistance that we face is frequently in the form of religious workers of our own kind. And I heard this also from uh, the same missionary that helped me, David Hogan. He said that, uh, you want to know who the strongholds are? This is his words. That's so much wisdom. I tell you, first of all, you hear me quote him all the time, and you would think I'd spent a year with the man. I've only spent a sum total of maybe five hours with David Hogan in my entire life. But so much wisdom comes so fast out of his mouth that everything is tattooed on your spirit. And one of the things he said was that you want to meet the strongholds, he said, do something for God. Start a work. He said, they'll come knock on your door and ask what you're doing. He said, that's how you meet them. And I thought that was really interesting. Because sure enough, through the years I've done things and people from those denominations, those groups will come up and say, you know, what are you doing? By what authority are you doing this? Whose group are you? So that's what that other guy started doing, asking me all those questions about this, that, the other. That's how you kind of know that, well, then, yeah, I'm not, I'm not questioning you. I'm not looking to know your, your details. I'm not looking to try. I'm not going to call you into question. So they do that. Why? Because they see you as an invasion. They are a stronghold in that region. At least they are cooperating with maybe the spirits that are over that area. Certainly different religions will do this, but sometimes even our own brothers. And so you need to know how do I deal with that? Well, this is what I teach you here. Three things we can do to live at peace with other missionaries. First of all, number one, never criticize other ministries. Please, I don't know why people feel the need to criticize other ministries. Look at this scripture. Teacher, said John, Mark 9, 38. We saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him, stop, because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Now, I want you to think about this. John prohibited others, this guy, from doing the work of the kingdom of God because they were not part of their group. He was not part of his posse, us four and no more mentality, I call this. That you have, your, we are the called of God and God's going to do something. He's going to do it through us. Hallelujah. And those other brothers, no, you can't say that. You don't know. Every church, if you had a church in every single corner, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Just don't judge each other and you'll be able to accomplish miracles. As Ruth Ost used to say years ago, and this is, I'm sorry, Ruby Ost used to say years ago that there's no competition between lighthouses stuck in my head forever. If I put a church up here and you put a church up just 100 feet or, you know, 50 meters that way, we're going to relate to different people. You relate to people. I relate to people. Don't criticize each other. In fact, in doing so, when you become critical of other ministries, you're running the risk of being judged by God to the extent of having a millstone hung around your neck and being thrown into the sea. You need to be very, very careful with your mentality. So we often form a rigid opinion of what the correct methodology of ministry is, right? According to our peripheral doctrines, desiring to see 
that everyone conform to our image. In other words, we want them to do exactly what we do and be exactly like we are so we become critical. You know, over there in that church, they do this and they do that. Well, in that church, they don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If they don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they're not operating the power of God. They're not operating the power of God. They're going to hell. They're nothing. They're obstacles. Well, that's horrible. That's terrible if you'd said that. There are ministers out there that will have more fruit in heaven than you can ever imagine that do not teach the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But they've won thousands and thousands of souls to Christ. There's no greater ministry when it comes to the acquisition of souls in the kingdom through the centuries in the United States of America other than Baptists and the preaching of the word solid base that they have a, a doctrine mostly that there's no such thing as a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I can't make, I can't criticize them for what they, what they don't believe. I can only judge them by what they believe. And you know what they believe? That Jesus Christ came in the flesh was crucified and buried, rose again on the third day. They confess it with their mouth and believe it. Now, outside of that cardinal doctrine, they might have other ideas. That's their business. Jesus is the unifying force between us, and I have no criticisms. I might be different, but you do what you do, I do what I do. There's no competition between lighthouses. And I'm not going to tell people that. Be careful when you start telling people about the evils of another ministry. You have no right to do that. I'll quote David Hogan again. Preach a real Jesus and they'll come. <laughs> That's what he used to say. Because one time I told him, I'm trying to do this and people aren't coming and I do this. And he says, you preach a real Jesus and they'll come. It's true. So it is don't criticize other people because they have more than you. Rejoice if they are more blessed than you are in that regard. And we know in those verses that we just saw there in verses 39 and um, to 42 that Jesus gets angry with them. Now don't stop him. All oh, those people, they're, they're doing things we don't do. They're doing it in a different way. They're not part of our group. They're not sanctioned by us. They don't have our endorsement. They don't have our permission. And we're the ones God sent here. This is our territory. This is our land. This is our jurisdiction. It's ridiculous. Don't stop him, Jesus said. For no one who does a miracle in my name in the next moment say anything bad about me. Whoever's not against us is for us, you, you dummy. He's rebuking his disciple. Remember how close he was to John. John was the one closest to him. He said, John, you're running the risk of having a millstone put around your neck and being thrown into the ocean if you keep this up. I'm sure that was the last day that John ever criticized anybody, and I bet you agree with me. Very important. My mother always said, if you don't have something good to say, say nothing at all. Number two, focus on your own vision. What's it that God told you to do? Why Don't you have enough on your plate just doing what God called you to do? When your nose is in your own business, you will be able to walk out your vision. You're so busy with what God calls you to do, you don't have time to critique the other men. I don't have time to talk about ministries here in Singapore. I don't have time to debate about what's being taught at any other church. I don't even know. Honestly, I've not even looked into it because I don't have the time to investigate the other churches. I don't have the time. I'm too busy. I'm too busy studying the Word and preaching and teaching and doing the core and praying for people and evangelizing and going into the nations. I'm too busy doing everything I have to do. I'll focus on my own vision. It's a full-time job. Why in the world do I want to go study any other ministry? They have great things to say, but I don't know anything about what's going on at, at Joseph Prince's church here in Singapore. I'm sure it's great stuff happening over there, but I don't know about it. I just, I, I don't know good or bad. Why? Because I'm busy doing what God called me to do. I don't know what's going on over at City Harvest. Yeah, they had some issues. I read the legal reports that came out later about certain money issues, but other than that, I don't know. I really don't know and have no idea what's happened since then. Focus on your own. A lot of missionaries spend their time bashing other ministries. This whole ministry is developed with the sole purpose of criticizing other ministries. How many millstones do they want? I say this too. Third thing. And we're going to finish with this. Give, but don't take. If your relationship with other missionaries, or in that relationship with other missionaries, you should be sure to bless them and provide them whenever possible. What does it say? If you consider them to be enemies against you, then what does it say? You turn the other cheek. You walk the extra mile. But beware of favors from them to you. 
Yeah, don't ever ask, oh, no man, anything but to love them because often these ministries are like the mafia and they do something for you. They think they own you. If they give you a church bench, they say they planted your church. So be cautious about that. Everything comes down to the control issue. Missionaries want the exclusive control over the region in which they work and sometimes they will not stop at anything to restrict your access to that area. Jealousy arises and they will curse you behind your back and smile in your face. They are the controlling spirits. I quote my friend Myra Fernandez. She would say that when they sing the high praises of you, watch out! Meaning that when they're saying all these great things about you and in your face with these great smiles, oh, yes, yes, brother, oh, we love you. Praise God for you. Yes, yes, yes. And they leave that room and with their friends and this man is bad, bad man, evil. He's just doing wrong. Send something wrong here. Something wrong. We need to warn the people. Yeah, it's just the way it is. So mind your own business. Focus on what God told you to do. Don't criticize anybody ever. Just do what God told you to do. That's my recommendation to you. God bless you. I'm so happy to be teaching this subject to you. As you can tell, it's one of my favorite subjects. I get so animated, so excited because I'm a missionary. Teaching you from the wealth of all of my experience, mistakes, failures, and successes. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you again soon.